Act 1, Scene 1. Madame Purnell and Flip it, her servant, Omire, Marianne, Clinte, Damis, Dory, Madame Purnell, come, come, Flip it, and let me get away. Omire, you hurry so, I hardly can attend you. Madame Purnell, then don't, my daughter-in-law. Stay where you are. I can dispense with your polite attentions. Omire, we're only paying what is due you, mother. Why must you go away in such a hurry? Madame Purnell, because I can't endure your carryings on, and no one takes the slightest pains to please me. I leave your house, I tell you, quite disgusted. You do the opposite of my instructions. You've no respect for anything. Each one must have his say. It's perfect pandemonium. Or even if Madame Purnell you're a servant wench, my girl, and much too full of gab, and too impertinent and free with your advice on all occasions. Damn is but Madame Purnell you're a fool, my boy F, O, O, L just spells your name. Let grandma tell you that I've said a hundred times to my poor son, your father, that you'd never come to good or give him anything but plague and torment. Mary Anne I think Madame Purnell oh dearie me, his little sister. You're all demureness, butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, one would think to look at you. Still waters, though, they say, you know the proverb, and I don't like your doings on this sly. Elmire but, mother Madame Purnell daughter, but your leave, your conduct in everything is altogether wrong, you ought to set a good example firm, their dear departed mother did much better. You are extravagant, and it offends me, to see you always decked out like a princess. A woman who would please her husband's eyes alone, wants no such wealth of fineries. Clinte, but, madam, after all, madam Purnell, sir, as for you, the lady's brother, I esteem you highly, love and respect you. But, sir, all the same, if I were in my son's, her husband's, place, I'd urgently entreat you not to come within our doors. You preach a way of living that decent people cannot tolerate. I'm rather frank with you, but that's my way I don't mince matters, when I mean a thing. Amos Mr. Tardif, your friend, is mighty lucky, Madam Purnell he is a holy man, and must be heeded. I can't endure, with any show of patience, to hear a scatterbrains like you attack him. Damis what? Shall I let a bigot criticister come, and usurp a tyrant's power here? And shall we never dare amuse ourselves till this fine gentleman deigns to consent? Doreen if we must hark to him, and heed his maxims, there's not a thing we do, but what's a crime? He censures everything, this Ellis Carper. Madame Purnell and all he censures, is well censured too. He wants to guide you on the way to heaven, my son should train you all to love him well. Damis no, madam, look you, nothing not my father nor anything can make me tolerate him. I should belie my feelings not to say so. His actions rouse my wrath at every turn, and I foresee that there must come of it an open rupture with this sneaking scoundrel. Doreen besides, tis downright scandalous to see this unknown upstart master of the house this vagabond, who hadn't, when he came, shoes to his feet, or clothing worth six farthings, and who so far forgets his place, as now to censure everything, and rule the roost. Madame Purnell eh? Worse he sakes alive. Things would go better if all were governed by his pious orders. Doreen he passes for a saint in your opinion. In fact, he's nothing but a hypocrite. Madame Purnell just listened to her tongue. Doreen I wouldn't trust him, nor yet is Lawrence, without bonds and surety. Madame Purnell I don't know what the servant's character may be, but I can guarantee the master a holy man. You hate him and reject him because he tells home truths to all of you. To sin alone that moves his heart to anger, and heaven's interest is his only motive. Doreen of course. But why, especially of late, can he let nobody come near the house? Is heaven offended at a civil call that he should make so great a fuss about it? I'll tell you, if you like, just what I think, pointing to Amire, upon my word, he's jealous of our mistress. Madame Purnell you hold your tongue, and think what you are saying. He's not alone in censuring these visits, the turmoil that attends your sort of people, their carriages forever at the door, and all their noisy footmen, flock together, annoy the neighborhood, and raise a scandal. I'd gladly think there's nothing really wrong, but it makes talk, and that's not as it should be. Clinte, madam, can you hope to keep folks' tongues from wagging? It would be a grievous thing if, for the fear of idle talk about us, we had to sacrifice our friends. No, no, even if we could bring ourselves to do it, think you that everyone would then be silence. Against backbiting there is no defense so let us try to live in innocence, to silly tattle pay no heed at all, and leave the gossips free to vent their goal. Doreen our neighbor Daphne, and her little husband, must be the ones who slander us, I'm thinking. Those whose own conduct's most ridiculous, are always quickest to speak ill of others, they never fail to seize it once upon the slightest hint of any love affair, and spread the news of it with glee, and give it the character they'd have the world believe in. By others' actions, painted in their colors, they hope to justify their own, they think, in the false hope of some resemblance, either to make their own intrigue seem innocent, or else to make their neighbors share the blame which they are loaded with by everybody. Madame Purnell these arguments are nothing to the purpose. Arante, we all know, lives a perfect life, her thoughts are all of heaven, and I have heard that she condemns the company you keep. Dorino admirable pattern. Virtuous stain. She lives the model of austerity, but age has brought this piety upon her, and she's a prude, now she can't help herself. 
As long as she could capture men's attentions, she made the most of her advantages. But now she sees her beauty vanishing. She wants to leave the world that's leaving her. And in the specious veil of haughty virtue, she'd hide the weakness of her worn out charms. That is the way with all your old coquettes. They find it hard to see their lovers leave him. And thus abandoned, their forlorn estate can find no occupation but a prude. These pious dames, in their austerity, must carpet everything and pardon nothing. They loudly blame their neighbor's way of living, not for religion's sake, but out of envy, because they can't endure to see another enjoy the pleasures age has weaned them from. Madame Purnell, too admired there. That's the kind of rigmarole to please you, daughter-in-law. One never has a chance to get a word in edgewise, at your house, because this lady holds the floor all day, but nonetheless, I mean to have my say, too. I tell you, that my son did nothing wiser in all his life, than take this godly man into his household. Heaven sent him here, in your great need, to make you all repent. For your salvation, you must hearken to him. He censures nothing but deserves his censure. These visits, these assemblies, and these balls, are all inventions of the evil spirit. You never hear a word of godliness of them, but idle cackle, nonsense, flim flim. Our neighbor often comes in for a share, the talk flies fast, and scandal fills the air. It makes a sober person's head go round, at these assemblies, just to hear the sound of so much gab, with not a word to say, and as a learned man remarked one day most aptly, tis the Tower of Babylon. We're all, beyond all limit, Babylon. And just to tell you, how this point came in, to clean tea, so. Now the gentleman must snicker, must he. Go find fools like yourself to make you laugh and don't, to admire, daughter, goodbye, not one word more. As for this house, I leave the half unsaid, but I shan't soon set foot in it again, cuffing flip it, come, you. What makes you dream and stand agape, hussy? I'll warm your ears in proper shape. March, trollop, march. Back to Clinte, Doreen Clinte I won't escort her down, for fear she might fall foul of me again. The good old lady, Doreen bless us. What a pity she shouldn't hear the way you speak of her. She'd surely tell you you're too good by half, and that she's not so old as all that, neither. Clinte how she got angry with us all for nothing. And how she seems possessed with her tardive. Doreen her case is nothing, though, beside her son's. To see him, you would say he's ten times worse. His conduct in our late unpleasantness had won him much esteem, and proved his courage in service of his king. But now he's like a man besotted, since he's been so taken with this tardive. He calls him brother, loves him a hundred times as much as mother, son, daughter, and wife. He tells him all his secrets and lets him guide his acts, and rule his conscience. He fondles and embraces him, a sweetheart could not, I think, be loved more tenderly. At table he must have the seat of honor, while with delight our master sees him eat as much as six men could. We must give up the choicest tidbits to him, if he belches, tis a servant speaking, master exclaims. God bless you. Oh, he dotes upon him. He's his universe, his hero, he's lost in constant admiration, quotes him on all occasions, takes his trifling acts for wonders, and his words for oracles. The fellow knows his dupe, and makes the most on't, he fills him with a hundred masks of virtue, gets money from him all the time by canting, and takes upon himself to carpet us. Even his silly coxcomb of a lackey makes it his business to instruct us too, he comes with rolling eyes to preach at us, and throws away our ribbons, rouge, and patches. The wretch, the other day, tore up a kerchief that he had found, pressed in the golden legend, calling it a horrid crime for us to mingle the devil's finery with holy things. Seen through Omeyer, Marianne, Damis, Clinte, Dorian Omeyer, to Clinte you're very lucky to have missed the speech she gave us at the door. I see my husband is home again. He hasn't seen me yet, so I'll go up and wait till he comes in. Clinte and I, to save time, will await him here. I'll merely say good morning, and be gone. Seen for Clinte, Damis, Dorian Damis, I wish you'd say a word to him about my sister's marriage. I suspect Tardif opposes it, and puts my father up to all these wretched shifts. You know, besides, how nearly I'm concerned in it myself. If love unites my sister and Valier, I love his sister too. And if this marriage were to, Dorian he's coming. Scene 5 Organ, Clinte, Dorian Organ ah. Good morning, brother. Clinte I was just going, but am glad to greet you. Things are not far advanced yet, in the country. Organ Dorian, to Clinte, just wait a bit please, brother-in-law. Let me allay my first anxiety, by asking news about the family. To Dorian, has everything gone well these last two days? What's happening? And how's everybody? Bori met him had fever, and a splitting headache day before yesterday, all day and evening. Organ and how about Tardif? Doreen Tardif. He's well, he's mighty well, stout, fat, fair, rosy-lipped. Organ poor man. Doreen at evening she had nausea and called touch a single thing for supper, her headache still was so severe. Organ and how about Tardif? Doreen he supped alone, before her, and anxiously ate up two partridges, as well as half a leg of mutton, deviled. Organ poor man. Doreen all night she couldn't get a wink of sleep, the fever racked her so, and we had to sit up with her till daylight. Organ how about Tardif? 
Lorraine gently inclined to slumber. He left the table, went into his room, got himself straight into a good warm bed, and slept quite undisturbed until next morning. Organ poor man. Doreen at last she let us all persuade her, and got up courage to be bled. And then she was relieved at once. Organ and how about Tardif? Doreen he plucked up courage properly, bravely entrenched his soul against all evils, and to replace the blood that she had lost, he drank at breakfast four huge draughts of wine. Organ poor man. Doreen so now they both are doing well, and I'll go straightway, and inform my mistress, how pleased you are at her recovery. Scene 6 Organ, Clinte Clinte brother, she ridicules you to your face. And I, though I don't want to make you angry, must tell you candidly, that she's quite right. Was such infatuation ever heard of? And can a man today have charms to make you forget all else, relieve his poverty, give him a home, and then? Organ stop there, good brother, you do not know the man you're speaking of. Clinte, since you will have it so, I do not know him, but after all, to tell what sort of man he is Organ dear brother, you'd be charmed to know him, your raptures over him would have no end. He is a man who ah. In fact a man who ever does his will, knows perfect peace, and counts the whole world else, as so much done. His converse has transformed me quite, he weans my heart from every friendship, teaches me to have no love for anything on earth, and I could see my brother, children, mother, and wife, all die, and never care snap. Clean to your feelings are humane, I must say, brother. Organa. If you'd seen him, as I saw him first, you would have loved him just as much as I he came to church each day, with contrite mean, kneeled, on both knees, right opposite my place, and drew the eyes of all the congregation, to watch the fervor of his prayers to heaven. With deep drawn sighs and great ejaculations, he humbly kissed the earth at every moment, and when I left the church, he ran before me to give me holy water at the door. I learned his poverty, and who he was, by questioning his servant, who is like him, and gave him gifts, but in his modesty, he always wanted to return apart. It is too much you'd say, too much by half, I am not worthy of your pity. Then, when I refused to take it back, he'd go, before my eyes, and give it to the poor. At length heaven bade me take him to my home, and since that day, all seems to prosper here. He censures everything, and for my sake he even takes great interest in my wife, he lets me know who ogles her, and seems six times as jealous as I am myself. You'd not believe how far his zeal can go, he calls himself a sinner just for trifles, the merest nothing is enough to shock him. So much so, that the other day I heard him accuse himself for having, well a prayer, in too much anger caught, and killed a flea. Clinte's ounce, brother, you are mad, I think, or else you're making sport of me, with such a speech. What are you driving at with all this nonsense? Organ brother, your language smacks of atheism, and I suspect your soul's a little tainted therewith. I preach to you a score of times that you'll draw down some judgment on your head. Clinte that is the usual strain of all your kind, they must have everyone as blind as they. They call you atheist, if you have good eyes. And if you don't adore their vain grimaces, you've neither faith nor care for sacred things. No, no, such talk can't frighten me. I know what I am saying. Heaven sees my heart. We're not the dupes of all your canting mummers. There are false heroes and false devotees. And as true heroes never are the ones who make much noise about their deeds of honor. Just so true devotees, whom we should follow, are not the ones who make so much vain show. What? Will you find no difference between hypocrisy and genuine devoutness? And will you treat them both alike, and pay the self same honor both to masks, and faces set artifice besides sincerity, confuse the semblance with reality, esteem a phantom like a living person, and counterfeit as good as honest coin? Men, for the most part, are strange creatures, truly. You never find them keep the golden mean, the limits of good sense, too narrow for them, must always be passed by, in each direction, they often spoil the noblest things, because they go too far, and push them to extremes. I merely say this by the way, good brother. Organ you are the sole expounder of the doctrine, wisdom shall die with you, no doubt, good brother, you are the only wise, the sole enlightened, the oracle, the Cato, of our age. All men, compared to you, are downright fools. Clinte I am not the sole expounder of the doctrine, and wisdom shall not die with me, good brother. But this I know, though it be all my knowledge, that there's a difference twixt false and true. And as I find no kind of hero more to be admired than men of true religion, nothing more noble or more beautiful than is the holy zeal of true devoutness, just so I think there's not more odious than whited sepulchres of outward unction, those barefaced charlatans, those hireling zealots. This sacrilegious, treacherous pretense deceives at will, and with impunity makes mockery of all that men hold sacred, men who, enslaved to selfish interests, make trade in merchandise of godliness, and try to purchase influence and office with false eye rollings and affected raptures. Those men, I say, who with uncommon zeal seek their own fortunes on the road to heaven, who, skilled in prayer, have always much to ask, and live a court to preach retirement, who reconcile religion with their vices, are quick to anger, vengeful, faithless, tricky, and, to destroy a man, will have the boldness to call their private grudge the cause of heaven, all the more dangerous, since in their anger they use against us weapons men revere, and since they make the world applaud their passion, and seek to stab us with the sacred sword. 
There are too many of this canting kind. Still, the sincere are easy to distinguish, and many splendid patterns may be found in our own time before our very eyes look at Ariston, Periander, Arant, Alcidamas, Clitander, and Polydor. No one denies their claim to true religion, yet they're no braggadocios of virtue. They do not make insufferable display, and their religion's human, tractable. They are not always judging all our actions, they think such judgment savored a presumption, and, leaving pride of words to other men, tis by their deeds alone they censure ours. Evil appearances find little credit with them, they even incline to think the best of others. No cabblers, no intriguers, they mind the business of their own right living. They don't attack a sinner tooth and nail, for sin's the only object of their hatred, nor are they overzealous to attempt far more in heaven's behalf than heaven would have him. That is my kind of man, that is true living, that is the pattern we should set ourselves. You fellow was not fashioned on this model, you quite sincere in boasting of his zeal, but you're deceived, I think, by false pretenses. Organ my dear good brother-in-law, have you quite done? Clinte yes. Organ I'm your humble servant. Starts to go. Clinte just a word. We'll drop that other subject. But you know Valier has had the promise of your daughter. Organ yes. Clinte you had named the happy day. Organ tis true. Clinte then why put off the celebration of it? Organ I can't say. Clinte can you have some other plan in mind? Organ perhaps Clinte you mean to break your word. Organ I don't say that. Clinte I hope no obstacle can keep you from performing what you've promised. Organ well, that depends. Clinte why must you beat about? Valier has sent me here to settle matters. Organ heaven be praised. Clinte what answer shall I take in? Organ why, anything you please. Clinte but we must know your plans. What are they? Organ I shall do the will of heaven. Clinte come, be serious. You've given your promise to Valier. Now will you keep it? Organ goodbye. Clinte, alone, his love, methinks, has much to fear. I must go let him know what's happening here.